Hey, welcome back to the Travel Ends Podcast. Today, my guest is Jim Morris. He's a professional speaker. Uh, you may or may not, everyone I've talked to says, oh yeah, uh, known for the, the movie The Rookie with Dennis Quaid. He was the, uh, he's the real life Dennis Quaid, I guess. I don't know if Dennis likes that, but <laughs> how are you today, Jim? Great, Pete. Thank you. I appreciate the time. It's it's interesting because I, I think I caught you in between travels. So yeah, and that's. It's I, always, a, I always tell people that's the, the curse and the blessing, you know, the blessings they get to talk to other business travelers, the curses, I have to wait till their schedule opens up. So, yeah. And it's been traveling is awesome because I like to sit back and watch. Yeah. But then there are some airport stories that are just hilarious. And just like, <laughs> why would you even try that? You're going straight to jail and that's all there is to it. Don't talk to anybody at a ticket counter like that. And oh, yeah. usually, Football fans are the the biggest people, uh, culprits I've seen. But actually, one of the funniest things that ever happened to me was a Sunday morning, and I was supposed to go to Palm Springs. And I get to the airport, and this is before they started doing you first full name, middle name, last name, yeah. everything you got. And so I just had Jim Morris. Well, during the week, my frequent flyer miles kept changing. And so Shauna kept going in and changing them back to me and then i get to the airport and i turn my ticket in and the kids are in the car with her they're going to church and they're like you already checked in i said well obviously i didn't i'm right here I'm right <laughs> i like, no, jim morris is sitting in your seat i go i am not sitting right now i am standing yeah. and what it ended up being was they called the guy out and i didn't know who it was at first but it was jim morris the comedian Oh. who does president's voices. And and so I called the people in Palm Springs. I said, you want the funny guy or the inspirational guy? They said, yeah. the funny guy. I said, have fun. I'm going to church. <laughs> oh, man. I was just, little mix-ups like that just make make you smile. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, man, that's funny, though. I, I I have a unique last name, so I've never had that issue. But uh, <laughs> Jim Morris, yeah, yeah, you're right, though. I never thought about it. You know, you've been speaking, public speaking now for, what, 20 plus years, give or take? 25. Okay. Yeah. You know, how's that been? I mean, it, it's it's like you're traveling and, and it's hit and miss, kind of like baseball. So it's like you're, you're in a town, do your thing, you get to go home. I know what entertainers talk about now when they go, I've been all over the world, but I've seen nothing. Nothing, yeah. And, um... Yeah, you live from plane ride to plane ride, and you see a lot of insides of airports and hotel rooms. But then when you're tired, you, you're you like, I could go see this, or I could take a nap real quick. <laughs> and, um, and then the nap usually wins. Yeah. And traveling has been fun for me because every audience is different. Yeah. Every audience has their strengths and their weaknesses. You know, whether you have accountants or or firemen or whoever professionally, and then you get to do the schools and you get to see the kids again and you get to do colleges and just talk to them. And it's, it's a very non-political speech that I do, but I never thought I would be a speaker. Yeah. My deal is about overcoming obstacles and persevering through anything. And, you know, my agent actually, Steve Cantor forged my name on my first speaking contract. <laughs> he goes, you're going to be a speaker. And I won't tell you what I said, but it wasn't very nice. It wasn't yeah. very Christian. And I said, no way. And he goes, too late. I already signed your name on a contract. I'm like, great. And it was the next week. It was at Major League Soccer front office people before soccer season started. My gosh. And he goes, write down everything you're going to say. You got to talk for 45 minutes and then call me and tell me how you did. Well, I got the book. <laughs> I got the book writer from the first book, The Oldest Rookie. And he's with me and he's in the back. He goes, did you write anything down? I said, nope. <laughs> and I got up and I started speaking and I was scared to death. And I didn't talk for 45 minutes, Pete. I talked for two hours. Yeah. And nobody moved. Nobody answered the phone. Nobody got up to go to the bathroom. 
and they were just glued. And I thought, huh. huh. And then when we finished and I did autographs and question answering pictures and stuff, the stories I heard back and the feedback I heard back, I was like, I can do this. And then he hires a guy to come down from Kansas City for five days. I have to pay the guy fully up front. And so he's going to come down, watch me, and he has me do it twice. I speak, then he films me. And he sits down, he goes, we don't need any more Tony Robbins. We need you. They're going to love you. Uh, and he just told me a few things not to do yeah. with my hands, like pushing your glasses up with your middle finger and and stuff like that. And he goes, <laughs> and at the time, back then, it was like nobody had facial hair. He goes, and don't grow facial hair. Yeah. I'm like, well, I don't have any hair on my head, so facial hair. Yeah. And and nobody's ever cared. So, but he stayed for two hours, not five days. But I had to pay for the five days anyway. Yeah, yeah. And since then, twenty five years, and and counting, we've already booked out next year, and it has been a lot of fun. And I've gotten to meet a lot of people all over the world, and traveling is incredible. And I love the people who have never been out of the country. Yeah. And they go, how could you go there? Well, we, you've been, and you're like, well, this is what I saw, and this is how the people were. Yeah. And they're like, really? It's like they don't know. And so then you get to explain the cultures and stuff to them, and that's a lot of fun, too. I, I, I'd asked Kurt Angle, the, the Olympic wrestler, uh, about the favorite place he's visited, and he said Moscow. And I was like, wow, okay. A lot of history. I never would have thought that, but he said, he said, I don't care about the politics, but the people there were just the most genuine giving people and i was like never would have thought that you know it's like but you know knowing he's a wrestler and wrestler wrestling is so so huge in in russia yeah sense. but what so what's what's the most influential place you've been to so far i think south korea uh oh, for a million dollar okay. round table and it's funny because there were 26 different dialects and i would say something that would be funny and then you would hear, ha -ha, <laughs> ha -ha, ha -ha, ha -ha. so then I learned to slow down so the interpreter could keep up with me. And then it was fine. But that was one of the best places I've ever been. Japan culture is awesome. Yeah. Um, Bora Bora is just fun. It's expensive, but it's fun. <laughs> and um, But Switzerland, Rome, I was amazed in Rome because I'm picturing everything I've ever read. And you're like, it is this amazing place and it is, yeah. but they have graffiti just like we do and other, yeah. you know, stuff, the stuff you don't places. see in the books. Yeah. And, and then you walk through this plain looking door that may or may not have graffiti on it and you open it up and it's a cathedral and it is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. And the decorations are ornate, the stained glass is incredible and just getting to be a part of where people, where culture started way back when is, to me, I, I'm a history guy, so yeah, I, I love things like that. Um, Switzerland was a blast, and we were on in Montreux, and I spoke to a group there, and but everybody's been so accommodating and so nice. Well, that's going to say, you know, Jim, <laughs> the reason you're speaking and re the reason you're famous, for one, is a great story. Even if it wasn't a Disney movie, it's just a great story. You know, b being a high school teacher, giving up on your career throwing it up, trying out because of the team. I mean, it's a great story. But then you have the Disney movie with Dennis Quaid. It's like everyone's, I mean, I, no one's like, uh, I didn't, I, I, I was just trying to think, I was like, has anyone ever come to you and said, I didn't really like the movie. <laughs> I can't imagine that. Roger Ebert. Oh, geez. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> that's, about, that's about it. Um, but it's still funny because we're still in contact with Dennis and either Shauna will contact him for something or I will have sent something and maybe months go by and then all of a sudden he'll text or call and, and it's still surreal 20 some odd years later and my phone rings. I look down, it says Dennis Quaid on it. I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah, that did happen. Yeah. But it was, it was a lot of fun when he took the job. He said, if he's seeing anything being filmed, you don't like you tell me and it's out. And he was true to his word yeah. and he is a true friend. And I've got to watch him transform over time and he probably gave me the best compliment of anybody from anywhere at any occasion i've ever been to the night we won the sb award for sports movie of the year yeah um we take our pictures we do our interviews 
they're Disney sending him to one party or sending me to another party. And he calls me back over and he hugs me. He goes, I just want you to know, thank you for helping me save my career. And I was like, wow. Yeah. That's huge for me. I'm like, I'm just this little redneck from Texas. And, (laughs) and you're thanking me for helping you turn your career around. And then look what he's done since then. Yeah. This has been incredible. The other thing I was amazed at was the energy he had. He's like a decade older than I am. Yeah. But he has a lot more energy than I have, man. The guy could just go and go and go. And we would film all day. And that started with him doing makeup pre-dawn. And then they would film all day. And then we would go into town and eat dinner. And then he would play on 6th Street with his band. And I would watch that for a while. I would get tired and go. And he's still playing. I'm like, I don't know how you do it, man. And he just boundless energy, good energy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, um, you're also an author. Yeah. You, you, the, the latest book, dream makers. Uh, I really enjoyed it so far. I'm, I'm, I told you earlier, I'm, I'm getting through it, but I, I enjoyed, you know, that the fact that you put dream killers in there, like you're not just saying, Hey, be a dream maker, but you're saying, watch out for dream killers too. So that was good. I really enjoyed the, uh, the oppositeness of it. And, well, thank you. And but there are those people in our lives, and whether they be family or people in positions that are supposed to help us, there are people who want to step on your dreams. And uh, dream killers to me started with my dad and, yeah. and various people throughout my life. But the dream makers, those are the ones you want on your team. Those are the ones that, when time times get tough, you want on your side because they're going to help you out. Because we're not all talented in the same thing. We all have different talents and something we're really good at. If you get the right people in the right position, or coin a baseball phrase, if yeah. we were all pitchers, we wouldn't score many runs, even though pitchers think they can hit. And everybody's got to play their position. Otani's, well. yeah. He's in a different yeah. galaxy. I yeah. mean, yeah. he's just incredible. I, I still can't believe a pitcher hit 50 home runs. Like Unbelievable. And pitcher. <laughs> and throw 100. Still 50. I'm like, what? Hold on. <laughs> He's just, he's just so talented and he's really brought a lot to the sport worldwide and yeah. he's made a lot more people dream baseball. So I'm, I'm all for that. And do you still follow baseball just like you used to, or is it? Um, I think I got pretty much, I got baseball out of my system when I got to go back and achieve the dream. Yeah. But I've kept up with friends over the years and now they've retired. Yeah. Yeah. And I still, there are people I want to watch. I want to watch people have fun while they're playing the game. They're getting paid a ridiculous amount of money to play. Yeah. And if they're having fun doing that, then I'm going to cheer for them because it's meant as a game. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's turning into this business. And baseball for me as a kid, like the first time I go out and my first appearance at the ballpark in Arlington, what hits me first is I walk out of the bullpen, popcorn, hot dogs, Oaks, the leather, yeah. dirt, the grass. The same thing as when I was seven. Now I'm 35. And I tell people, you know, at 19, if I'd have got that dream, I probably would have taken it for granted and been a little brat. Totally but at 35, learning how hard life is and raising a family, man, I appreciated it so much more. You get to the ballpark early and talk to big league ball players about yeah. how they might hit against a certain pitcher, how they might pitch against a certain hitter, and just talk sports and to me, that was the most fun part. So uh, a question I wanted to ask you is in real life, from the time you, you had the tryout to to you playing with with the major leagues, how, how much time was in between? How much time did you spend in the minors and all that? Three months. Okay. Because I, I was just trying to imagine being a high school teacher, coaching high school baseball in, in, in a very small town in Texas uh, to – sharing a locker with Wade Boggs and and yeah I mean that's just mind-blowing I can't like I, I try and do that even today and I'm like nope can't can't picture it oh it's funny for three months they heard about the crazy science guy who yeah. could throw a hundred and I walk in and Wade Boggs is the first person to come up to me and he he hugs me and he goes man that is the best story I've ever heard in my life and I'm I'm still a fan and a coach right and I'm yeah like, exactly 
you're Wade Boggs. You like chicken. That's what came out of my mouth, man. And I'm like, oh, you did not say that. And he giggled and he walked off. And yeah. Jose Canseco and Roberto Hernandez and Fred yeah. McGriff, uh, one of the best dads I've ever seen is Fred McGriff. And what a good person that man is. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, literally going from being a fan, watching him on TV to. To stretching next to him. Yeah. I, mean, I got Jose Canseco across from me. I got Wade Box to my right. I got Fred McGriff on my left, and we're all stretching. I can't even imagine. Out. Oh, it's a dream come true. Yeah. And had it come true at 19, it wouldn't have meant that much to me. But at 35, that meant a lot to me. I was going to say, you know, uh, there was a quarterback, J Johnny Manziel. He's the same age as my, my oldest daughter. And I'm like, I can't imagine. Like, he was 21, I think, when he, when he you know, left college to be a, become a pro and become a multi-hundred millionaire guy. And you're like, how would I be if I was 20, 21 years old and they gave me a hundred million dollars and I was world famous and people were kissing my butt everywhere I went. And I can't even like, I couldn't I look at that. my fifties. <laughs> yeah. I look back at my 21 year old self and I know exactly what would have happened. My head would have got big. <laughs> yeah. And then you think nothing stinks and you're like, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Well, that catches up with you real fast. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it was, it was a blessing that it, it you took that extra time. It was a blessing because then I learned what hardship was. Yeah. I tell people now I go, I, I used to have the ability, but no wisdom. Now I got the wisdom. I've got no ability left, <laughs> but I know how to do it. But I just can't. But yeah. no, it was definitely more gratifying at 35, especially being at Fenway and remembering back when I was 10 years old and watching yeah. Hank Aaron and the Braves play Carlton Fisk and Fred Lynn and, and the Red yeah. Sox. And yeah. that was just an incredible, incredible time. That's so and then cool. getting to play on the field when I was 35. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, like you said, you, you could soak it in a little bit more at that point, too. I could. And I looked up right in the stands where I sat as a little leaguer going, that's yeah. where I sat. And I think Carlton Fisk hit two home runs, almost three that night. Oh, shit. I don't think Hank did anything. But we got baseball signed by Hank Aaron. And and if anybody's seen the movie Sandlot, man, I lived in Connecticut. The first yeah. snowstorm we had, we ran out of baseballs. And I went, I got one. And I ruined the baseball in like 30 seconds. And Russell Athletics was one of the endorsers for the movie. And he was the head endorser. Oh, okay. He and I ring the closing bell at the stock market. God. And you, you have this vision of what a hero is in yeah. your mind when you're a kid. And then as you get older, you wonder, are they really like I built them up to be? Yeah, yeah. Or would they let you down? And as I'm telling him the story about how I send lot of his autograph, the most genuine, nicest person I think I've ever met. And he just put his arm around me and he, he laughed and his body shook. And it was just, he was even better than my little league mind could put my, yeah. my head around. And just a nice person. So the people I've gotten to meet over the years has been incredible. I was going to say, uh, what other people have you met that, that have blown you away? I mean, you, you, well, I got to assume you've met just a ton of people. I've met a lot of people and you know, yeah. Hollywood can have Hollywood, um, except for a few people. And I got to meet a bunch of people on the movie set and I arrived late one night and Brian Cox had come in to film the part of my dad. And I've been coaching and teaching. I don't watch movies. I don't yeah. see TV. I never see anything. And at the end of his performance, they all give a standing ovation. And I looked at Steve, my agent, I go, oh, who's that? Goes, That's Brian Cox, man. And then I go home and he's like on every movie I see. And I'm like, oh, that's who he is. <laughs> I had no clue. But they ask us during the movie process, Dennis and I, you know, somebody different would come by and go, if you could have dinner with anybody, who would it be? Uh, if you could have dinner with anybody, who would it be? And so we kind of forgot about that. And we get to New York and Disney had set up a dinner at the 21 Club with 21 Hall of Famers, uh, 10 from my era that I grew up with and 10 from Dennis's era that he grew up with. And to have Ozzy Smith go, if you don't cry when you see this movie, you don't have a heart. Yeah. 
that was just that was incredible. I had I pitched 22 games in the big leagues. Willie Mays asked for my autograph. <laughs> I just blown away by yeah. what the movie meant to even baseball players because we all have a dream no matter whether yeah. it's sports or something else and we want to be successful and get those people around us to push us up towards our dream but to have these guys who had set records like my agent sitting there going in the eighth inning with two outs and a guy on second you hit 321 I'm like dude that was like 40 years ago how do you remember yeah. that stuff he goes it's all up here man it's all up here I'm like all right and but that was hit he's a statistics guy yeah i'm a fan and so just to be able to look back at that and go i get to hang out with those guys for several hours that was fun that's that's awesome i mean I've, I've just... met, yeah i've met a lot of actors that i'm actually i thought negatively of and then i meet them and i'm like you're just like we are man yeah and you're down to earth and the camera's not on and they don't act they're yeah. just being and to be a human being amongst those human beings is pretty cool and i would tell people because yeah i live in los angeles area you know for 40 years i tell people you know famous people have bad days too you know so even if i meet right. somebody that's famous and i want to say his name but you know maybe you just have maybe he just left the doctors with some bad news or maybe Right. Yeah, you know, he didn't get the job he was hoping to get, or whatever. It's like we all have bad days, bad moments. So try not to uh, judge people. Just I've had my share. I guess the one I missed was Dennis and I had gone shopping in Cleveland, and it was cold, man. Yeah. I mean, real cold. And we get on the elevator, and this dude comes in behind us. And he's got on this great big toboggan thing on top of his head, and I'm like, "That's a hat." But he has his back to us. And then he gets off at a floor and the door closes and Dennis goes, How's Robin Williams? Uh, well, I'm like, ah, oh, dude. I could have met Robin Williams. Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah. But kind of to meet a lot of people, and especially through Dennis. He knows everybody. And but to meet my childhood idols, because Disney was actually afraid the movie wouldn't do well with adults because it was rated G. And so they sent Dennis and I around the country on the Disney jet. The Disney jet doesn't suck. It was fun. Yeah. But we'd go to all the big cities. And that's when I found out, I'm glad I'm a dude. I don't wear makeup. Yeah. Because at 3.30 a.m., there's a knock on my door, and they're coming to do makeup for the early morning shows. Where we do the morning shows, the radio. And then yeah. we'd hang around for lunch and then introduce the movie to a group of celebrities from that town. And I got, because we lived on the West Coast when I was young. And so Vita Blue. We got to meet yeah. him. And then you go out to the East Coast, and I get to meet Louis Tion. And I mean, yeah. got to meet so many people. And, you know, baseball for me was a dream since I was a kid. And I played every sport. And you, you've you read the book. My dad was very abusive. So the more I could do to stay out of the house, I did. And sports for me was my saving grace. And anybody who's going to look at someone and go, they make too much money doesn't know that you might pick up a piece of paper the wrong way yeah. and something tears or you might move too quickly in the shower and slip and bust an ACL or MCL and, and then Over. you're done. Yeah. And these guys are top notch and they're that way for one reason. They've worked to get there. And I think I understand that better now at when I was 35 than I did, especially when I was 19. Cause when you're 19, you're invincible. And you're like, I'll just bounce back. I'll just bounce back. Yeah. And then it finally, you get up around 30 and you're like, I'm not bouncing back. Like I, I used to. Yeah. And then at 60, I'm like, I'm really not bouncing back now. If I fall, I might stay there. <laughs> and, but we learn as we go and yeah. hopefully we gain that wisdom and we can share it with other people. And it's, it's that's why I like traveling. I was going to say, is that what you enjoy about traveling and then, and then also do, doing the seminars? Cause like, I'm like you, I mean, I, I read the book and I was like, man, this guy, like I'm an, I'm an introvert. My wife's shocked that I, that I'm talking to people, but like, like I told you earlier, this is one-on-one. -on -one. I could do this all day long. But when I get in big groups and crowds, I just, I'm, I'm the quiet one. I'm the one watching in the back and mm -hmm. kind of viewing, but I love traveling. I love seeing other people. I love interacting with other people. It's just, 
And, and, and your, your take on movies, I was the exact same, man. I, I, I did a extra work on a movie called Sister Act. And I was like, I, we, we, a, a, a shot we filmed, it took five hours. And it's, it's, if it's two seconds on film, I'd be surprised. I mean, it's the first opening scene. And, and like they shot it five different ways, you know, and I'm just like, this is a waste of time, man. I can't believe this. Like, I, that was just not for me sitting around and wait. So, yeah, I'm not good at that, but I'm also, I'm a lot better with crowds than I am one on one. And I don't know why that is. That's weird. Other than, I guess, my kids made me adaptable. If I mess up, I fess up, just, just go, you know what? <laughs> I up, I'm wrong. And this is the way it is because kids will let you know real quick. And, that's and so that's why I'm saying the more people, the better for me, because then I can feel the energy. One on one stuff is a little bit rougher, but I've had some incredible conversations on planes that I wouldn't, I would never give back. And I've gotten to meet a lot of people. Yeah. Um, sitting next to people, I didn't even know who they were because if they were a man, they were kind of disguised. And yeah. And if they're a woman and they're not wearing their makeup, you don't get that either because the film picks it up totally differently than you do in person. And so to find out who they were sitting next to me, during, the only exception was Big from Big and Rich. When he sat next to me, I knew it because he's like 6'6". Six, six, and I'm yeah, like, Kenny, yeah. I know exactly who you are. Yeah, and, yeah. But it was it's a lot of fun to meet people. And airports is just such a blast for people watching, especially somebody with – a degree in psychology and you sit back and you can almost tell by how somebody's carrying themselves, how they're doing. Yeah. And something's weighing them down or something's really got them lifted, uplifted. And that part to me is, is fun. And I was flying home one night to Dallas when we lived up there and this lady sitting next to me. And I know she was from India because of how she was dressed. And she didn't talk to me the whole flight. And when we get done, I don't know this lady from Adam. Yeah. She looks at me and she goes, you need to keep doing what you're doing. God's happy about it. And I'm like, okay. And that's all, that's all she said. She goes, you have a good evening. I'm like, how does she know what I do? What is she talking about? I mean, I'm like, wow. And stuff like that, when you're feeling tired or down and stuff like that can pick you back up. And you're like, I have energy again. Let's go. And no doubt. I was going to say, it's kind of cool. I think it's, it'd be kind of cool to be in your spot because if you want and you introduce yourself, everyone's like, oh, but for the most part, you can walk to an airport and no one's like, oh, yeah, that's Jim Morris versus, you know, that's right. Any, you know, or, or John Rich or whoever, you know, <laughs> you kind of got that. The only that. time that happened. Only time that happened is when we did a Larry King interview and I still had hair <laughs> and Dennis and I had done Larry King and I'm walking through the airport at 3 a.m. in Pittsburgh and these three guys were walking and two of them didn't notice me. The third one did. And he kind of let them go up ahead and he circled back around and he goes, can I get your autograph? And he goes, I won't tell anybody else you're here. And he recognized me and there have been places and restaurants and stuff where they used to recognize me. And I'm glad I don't look like Dennis yeah. because for a long time, I didn't understand the scope and the microscope that Hollywood is under and how everybody knows the people who are there. And to the point where Dennis was my friend, by the time we get through filming and the movie comes out, Russell Athletics has a big party in Vegas in a room that's made for 500 and there were like a thousand people in there. Yeah. And we couldn't, we could not move. And Dennis worms his way over to me. He goes, I got to get out of here. Come on. And now he's just my friend. He's not a movie star. He's not yeah. playing me. And so we walk out in the casino. There's not anybody there because they're all at the party. And so he sits down at the blackjack table. I sit down with him. We're drinking a water. And five minutes later, I look up and there's like 10,000 people around our table. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's quick. You're a movie star. Yeah. And that scope doesn't really ever hit you and, and until you see it in person you're like whoa yeah. and i couldn't imagine being like tiger woods or otani or anybody like that because yeah. you can't go anywhere you're recognizable all over the world i remember so, so you brought it big and rich so one of the guys that 
performed with him is Cowboy Troy, Troy Coleman. Yeah. And, uh, and and so the company I work for is sponsored Troy. I've known Troy for 14. He was my second guest on my show like six years ago. Nice. And he actually gave me a lot of advice. But uh, so he's just Troy to me. Like he comes and signs autographs in the booth and all that. And then he helps us sell boots because he used to work at Foot Locker. You know, he's like, I still have my Foot Locker jersey. Keeps me humble. You know, I know I can go, I can go back to it. So, but we went out to dinner one time during the rodeo in, in Las Vegas. And uh, I'm like, yeah, let's go out to dinner. Da, da, we go out to dinner. And while we're just sitting there getting caught up and all that, like drinks are coming by and getting dropped off at the table. And I'm like, oh, that uh, that table over there wanted uh, uh, some drinks uh, given to, to Troy and all that. And Troy's like, thanks, you know, we do shots. And then uh, the waiter comes back and says, hey, hey, Troy, uh, they want to know if they can come over and get an autograph. They don't want to bother you. And so, yeah, yeah, come on, why? And it's kind of the same thing, right? It's like where you're like, it's just yeah. Troy. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, but he's also the one performing on stage with Big and Rich and, you know. Right. But it, yeah, yeah, super nice guy. Just I, yeah. so I'm like you. I couldn't imagine that. Like I, I don't know that I'd want that. I know that when I travel, I don't mind it. I love going and meeting people wherever they are. Yeah, yeah, and learning whatever it is about whatever part of the world or whatever part of the states we're in. But when I get home, home is my vacation. Yeah, and so it's a good name. I'm just like mean. That. Fortunately, my friends don't give a rip <laughs> if I was a, a baseball player had a movie made about me they don't care yeah and I'm just Jimmy and and to my kids I'm just dad yeah and you didn't do anything special whatever and the humility needs to stay because I agree like I said when I was young I don't know that I would have had the humility and the humbleness that I have now now I'm like why did they even make a movie I it's, I still don't understand how all that came into being and, but I'm glad it did because I got to meet yeah. some incredible people on this journey. Well, I think, I mean, I'm trying to think I, I've watched maybe several times, but I think because it, it, it affects people differently. Like, I mean, like my dad, what I, I was going to ask you, do you think it was, it's, it was cultural at the time? Cause my dad was rough too. And, uh, was it just the I way they part were of raised, it, you know? Because I, I know my dad loved me, was, but he was just a jerk sometimes. I don't know that my dad loved me. Yeah. I know he didn't want me and um, said so. I know there were a couple of times that I was fearful for my life from him. Um, but there are people I've talked to who went to school with him when he was a kid who are now CEOs or superintendents or whatever their job may be, who I've gone in and talked to their groups. And afterwards, they're like, I grew up with your dad. He was like that from day one. Yeah. And he would start a fight with people or on the baseball field, he would drill somebody just so he could get in a fight. I mean, I just thought something happened early in his life that fractured him that he carried and he never got rid of. Yeah. And I don't know what that was, but um, it was serious enough that I had to go to 30 different schools in nine years because he kept getting busted. And when the military got tired of busting, they tried to make him an MP. If you want to fight, then you be an MP. Yeah. And he got in a fight with the commanding officer and we get transferred again. He just was angry, angry person. So I know something happened to him in his childhood, but I don't know what it was. I know it wasn't from my grandparents. I know. I mean, that's, it's interesting to me, but I think that's, and so between having a rough dad or wanting to, not achieving what you thought you could have achieved. Um, and then just the music. I mean, it's a great movie. I mean, so I, I think that's why it affects them. Everybody I've talked to, I'm like, oh, I'm interviewing Jim Morrison, right? Are you kidding? I'm like, no. I'm like, that's cool. Give, give me knuckles. I'm like, all right. So, <laughs> well, thank it's you. A, it's putting a positive effect on a lot of people. It's awesome. I also think that it helped. And this is a bad day, but it was came out six months after 9-11. Yeah, And the, the letters and things I've gotten over the years from parents and moms especially who went, my husband and son and I went to the movies, they were not even talking to me. And they were standing on either side of me when we went in the movie theater and we came out, they had their arms around each other. Yeah, That means the world to me. 
That's just huge. Because that that is just that's incredible. You know, to, to give people an idea, yeah, uh, Big Oak, Texas, is a town of twenty six hundred people. Now I don't know about what it was back then, but it's twenty six hundred people now, and and I always tell people it's like you know because I live in California, right? So they're like, oh, okay, well, go, no, no, but it's twenty six hundred, and then what thirty miles <laughs> to 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 anything else around there. It's not like I mean, like I live in Redondo, it's seventy thousand, but I'm surrounded by twelve million people. There right. you're twenty six hundred people, and there's nothing around. And you're surrounded by twenty six million cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and oil derricks. Yeah. <laughs> And rattlesnakes. Let's not forget that. Yeah, yeah, snakes. Gotta have snakes. Man, my kids knew I hated snakes, my team. And one day I go in because they knew which part of the bench I sit on every day to fill out my workout sheet. Oh, shoot. And they're like, coach, snake, snake. And I hop up and they have a dead rattlesnake coiled up underneath me. Yeah. So after I changed pants, yeah, yeah. we ran a little bit. I was going to say. I would, and they laughed the whole time. They didn't wait till the, yeah, the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in San Diego, I that's I, I killed my first rattlesnake in San Diego. I, I yeah, was, you guys got some mean little critters up in the hills. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we got a lot of coyotes. We've been seeing a lot of coyotes lately, and foxes, and opossum, raccoons. And I, I live in the city. <laughs> yeah, so I'm out in out in the wild. How many how many uh, trips do you do a year on average? How many how many speaking engagements have you been doing since COVID got out? Pre pre COVID sixty, okay. and then we had to learn how to do the virtual stuff. Yeah, and um, it's difficult picking up energy when you're talking to yourself on a screen. Yeah, and so I'm glad to be back on the road now. Last year was good. This year has been incredible, and to the point where people can't even stuff has been so booked out for people to catch up on their meetings and be in person that venues are taken on the weekends. And most of my speeches are during the week and wow. which doesn't bother me because yeah, that means I get home and I get to have a week. It's not a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And go to church and catch up and hang out with my friends who let me know what you do is not very important. So shut up. And, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> But it's grounding to get to be able to go out and do that. So we're back up to, I think, by middle of December, we'll be over 70. Wow. Well, that's good. And then you had the travel front end and back end. I know. And everything in between and hardly anything goes straight through anymore. So you got to go pick up another plane. And that, I don't understand how flight attendants and pilots do not become hydrated prunes, dehydrated yeah. prunes. And because I just find myself drinking water, 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 water. And I, I had, being up there. One of my guests said, uh, uh, put some salt tablets in there yeah. to, to kind of rehydrate and get the, the electrolytes built up without the sugar and everything else that's in some of the drinks. But uh, so, yeah, I've been taking the salt tablets too when I when I travel. Just yeah, to, us like, too. Just to hydrate. Yeah, we do that. And I've actually gotten used to the taste now. So, yeah. I like sugar and you, me both brother. But, um, my wife went, well, that's not good for you. And then I lost a lot of weight and she goes, you need sugar. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I cheat and I do the IV hydration stuff that has yeah. salt and sugar in it. And so I like those flavors a lot better than I like the stuff that she's drinking with. It's just basically make you pucker up. Yeah. Well, yeah, and like I said, that for me, that just the if I can get water in the salt tabs, I just go, you know. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm a sugar guy. So that's this is the wrong time of year to to try and quit sugar. With Absolutely, it is, man. Halloween up on candy holiday time. On. Oh man, it's brutal. It's brutal. I bought a bag of it today, and I have to say, we live in a retirement community. It's not for kids because kids don't come up here. It's for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. So I can still say that. I can still say, well, you know, if no one comes to the door, I'll just, you know, I got to make sure I want it. That's right. So my I wife's like, pick out the kinds I like. Yeah, my wife's like, uh, this is all the stuff you like. And I'm like, well, hey, what if the kids don't come this year? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You got to, right? You know, yeah. how, how hard is it? Does Sean tra tra travel with you most of the time or once in a while or? 
She does. And if you've gotten through most of the book, um, there was a point in time where I couldn't even button the buttons of my own shirt yeah. uh, because of Parkinson's. And so she started traveling with me. Fortunately, our fifth child was the one that we could trust to take care of our house better than we could. Yeah. And so she was a junior when we started, she started traveling with me. Okay. And she's been traveling with me ever since, even after I, I got well. And, you know, people go, well, why you? I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't have Parkinson's anymore. Uh, they took the deep brain stimulator out. I'm good. And, <clears throat> but I have fun now because the kids are grown and they have kids. Yeah. And number one, I'm a grandpa. Grandkids are way more fun than kids. They're awesome. I and, got my um, first one and another one on the way, so I'm, I'm good. Congratulations, man. Yeah, man. I got three granddaughters, and it is just the look in their eyes when they see us. Yeah. And the love, because I truly believe that kids can see through the heart of a person. And there are people that my grandkids will go to, and there are people they will not go to. Yeah, absolutely. And Fortunately, I'm one of the ones they'll go to. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting the uh, my my daughter who's now pregnant with her our second granddaughter. Uh, it, it says the same thing. She's like, I don't know. Zoe goes to, right to you. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. My 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 wife always says, I knew I picked a good guy because dogs and and kids like you. So. She goes, I knew you were a good guy because if dogs pick, get a good feed on you and kids like you, you're all right. So Yeah, same that, with me. That was the litmus test for me. It's like dogs and kids. I was like, all right, I got that one. That's awesome. Hey, I think grandkids are great because like, I remember like when, when I had my kids, there was the pressure of, oh, sh shoot, I got I to gotta buck up now and start feeding these kids. You know, and now I got the pressure of the entire house. I got... And now I don't, now it's just, now I just get to give them all the love, you know, I don't have the stress of thinking, oh shoot, I got to feed them and clothe them and bathe them and school them and everything else. Well, I'll tell you what else. I'm glad I'm not a kid today because there is, it's just a different time than when we grew up and I don't know how my kids are raising their kids the way they are because it is a tough world out there right now. And there's so many things being thrown at them. Yeah. But I mean, we used to get bullied at school and then you would go home and you'd be fine. Now they get bullied at home because of social media and yeah. then just different things. I mean, the abundance of drugs and everything else is just hard to navigate in today's world growing up Yeah, I guess several decades ago. Well, we do, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I just interviewed a guy and he said, we're, we're two, about two generations away from having everyone digital native, being a digital native person. Meaning I grew up, no phone, no computer, no, you know, one TV in the house. And, and, and I was the remote control, you know, exactly. And, uh, and so to my, even my daughters who got, I think they got their, they were like the last girls to get their phone and they were like in sixth grade. I, you know, I, 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 I tortured them by not getting it in fourth and fifth grade because all their friends had phones at that time. And I'm like, you don't need a phone. You're in sixth grade. What are you talking about? But that's going to all going to change now. They said, you know, in two generations, no, no one alive is going to know what life is without a computer. Right. You know, and nobody's going to go to a library. Yeah. Reading a map, you know, I mean, I, I remember teaching my, my daughters how to read a map. Like, okay. Go to C2, you know, here, here, F find, find the address, look in that, in that square. It's somewhere in there. It was, it was funny with my kids because, especially with my girls, because they're younger than the boys quite a bit. And we had a secret language that we could write to each other in called cursive. <laughs> and they couldn't read it. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. Man, I was tortured by teachers so much on making my F's right, making my yeah. T's right. And you guys don't even have to learn this anymore. Yeah. You suck. <laughs> and they just, just something they didn't grow up with. They grew up with this right here and right now. Yeah. And and then now they'll ask me questions. Then they'll look it up on the phone real quick. And they're like, oh, dad, you're right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I lived it and you're reading about it. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I can't. 
I can't imagine going to imagine going to school now. I mean, when your library is literally your phone. No. Like you wouldn't have to go to a library anymore. I mean, like everything you can do, I won't even get into AI, you know, right. Like, with, with, with writing papers and doing reports and all, I mean, I forget about it. Like, you know, I would have enjoyed it's a different time. <laughs> it's a different world. You know, I grew up when the, when the computer took up a whole desk. Yeah. And like a six foot desk. And you're like, and our teachers would go, this is the wave of the future. And I'm like, Dot Whatever. matrix printer, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and then now here it is, and it's on a little bitty phone. You know, I, I, everything I you could ask. The Apple watches, where you can actually, yeah. you know, the Jetson stuff, you can actually do it now. I know it's. I got my ring on that tells me what my heart rate, and yeah. my blood pressure is, and yeah. if I slept good or not. And I'm like, do I need that? And then I'll get up one morning and it'll say you didn't sleep good, and my score is low, and I'm like. I, I must be tired. I did okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one I see is like my, my, my granddaughter and uh, my, my daughter, obviously, and son in law live in Tennessee. So I can FaceTime them every week. And like now, my, my, my 18 month old is walking around with the phone showing grandpa stuff, you know, that she did this, you know. I mean, at I'm, her height. Yeah. Isn't yeah. I'm cool? right I mean, it's awesome. I used to get the kids' pictures like when we went to Disney World. Yeah. With for ESPN's deal. And all the pictures you could tell the little people's film because that's from their point of view. And the same thing with FaceTime now, my grandkids will take off and they're like, see this, see this. And yeah. it's everything we wouldn't notice as an adult, but it's very important to them. It's right there. And so they bring us down to their level. And I love that. Yeah. And that part of it, FaceTime is a blast. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, that, to me, the technology is all worth it. You know, with them being two 2,000 miles away, it's like, forget about it. I can still see her every week, though. That's awesome. I was going to ask you, because you travel so much, was that a, did that become a deciding factor where you chose to live? Sean is my second wife. Yeah. And um, we've been married for 22 years. And she's from El Paso. And I went to high school in Texas. Yeah. In the middle of my ninth grade year, my parents moved me back to my grandparents' house. And so I've been in Texas since I was 15. And then all our kids are here, except for one, our, our Oregon flower child is out there in Oregon, yeah. Yeah, but she's working for the Department of Education and she's doing great, but she loves where she is. The other four and the grandkids are all here in Texas and it just made sense to stay here. Okay. I've got great friends in the Nashville area and I would love to live there, but that would make me further away from my kids. Right. And um, I don't want that. Yeah. I mean, even the, the proximity, I mean, like if you lived in Big Lake, what's the closest international airport? You know, I mean, so like Oof. being where you're at, it's good. I mean, and, and then you're centralized. It's got to help. Yes, we are centralized. And and I appreciate that part of it because I know there are guys that live. Well, on one side or the other. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got them lose a whole bunch of time or gain a whole bunch of time and that throws your clock off and you travel like I do that yeah. messes with you after a while. You're like, I don't even know what time zone I'm in anymore. Well, I, yeah, I, I like I, being, I flew into Nashville. It's two hours ahead. Then I had to drive to Chattanooga to open up a boot barn store there. But then you cross Eastern standard time going into Chattanooga. Right. And then, so I had to make sure, <laughs> you know, you start working backwards because and then it was literally the weekend of the clock change. So I was like, so I landed at 10, but I it's really eleven in Chattanooga and I can't check in. But then I have to check in, you know, and then go backwards. So I have to get back to Nashville at X time, but it's an hour behind, plus it's an hour ahead. I was like, Oh, it's wrong wrong weekend to travel. My wife had one of those mornings this morning trying to put our travel together. Yeah. And she's like Phoenix in November. Is it one hour or two? What time is it? Yeah. And because our phones do our times from where we are. Yeah, yeah. Not where we're going to be. Absolutely. And so she's got she got several of our trips mixed up. And she's like, I am so confused right now. I don't even know what to do. Help me. <laughs> and I'm like, Let me help you out. Yeah. And yeah, we all get in that position now, especially older. I think our kids know where they are. 
all the time. They know all that technology stuff and they can keep up with it real quick. For people who grew up with clocks on the wall and you could hear it in your classroom going tick, tick, yeah. tick. It's a different world. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to embrace it. You know, it's like with, with my show, everything I have here is because I asked, I asked my 29 year old daughter now, Hey, uh, I want to do this. How do I do it? And she's like, she, she you know, I kept getting these texts. Hey, use this program. Use this. My use this. Do this. I'm like, okay. It's weird. This isn't part it? I can do, but getting everything yeah. set up, getting everything to get to this part is yeah, a little yeah. bit different. <laughs> it, it, how how is that? Has speaking over the last twenty years changed for you? Do you use more slides or anything like that? I do not, but I learned that from a classroom. Okay. If I do slides or if I hand out printouts about Something what I'm going to cover or anything, then their attention is not on what I have to say. It's on what they're reading. Yeah. And so I've always been the person who doesn't use a whole lot of slides. I use a clip from the movie at the beginning. And then I go out and I just, I talk to whatever direction it is that the company wants me to talk or the school. And I've done so much right and so much wrong in my life that I can pretty much covered. hit everything <laughs> they want and yeah, exactly. just keep going. <laughs> and but I know this if I'm going down a, a rabbit trail and I really catch somebody's attention that's the direction I will go Yeah. and I look for that one person who and it might be a thousand people or fifteen hundred but I see one person perk up on something that I said and that's the road I go down I got you. and it'll resonate with everybody and I've, I've been doing that for 25 years and I think I've gotten better at it over time. And so it's easier for me to pick up on now. And yeah. that part to me, I haven't been forced to change yet. And so I'm not going to, and people love me sure. because I'm just Your gym. down to earth. And, yeah. you know, I got, I'm the next door guy who got to have something really incredible happen because of a group of kids. I mean, just, I'm not talking to you had it not been for high school kids. I'm not going back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, I think that's why that movie resonates with so many people though, because it, it is, you're just a normal guy who, well, it, it's amazing that when we did the movie process, we went and met all these studio guys, Bill Plaschke for the LA times writes this yeah, big yeah. article, covers the front page of the Sunday paper. And so that night in the hotel, they had my third night, I think, in the big leagues, they had changed my name in the hotel because people were trying to get through all night documentaries, books, oh, wow. interviews. And they're all. And so for those four days, we're in, playing the Angels. I'm going around for breakfast and brunch, meeting studio execs. And there were a lot of meetings that I'd got up and I just walked out. I didn't even say goodbye. I just went, I'm done. And so when we're walking across the grounds of Disney, Michael Eisner was the president of Disney then. And Mark Chiardi, a producer of the movie, I, was one of my roommates back in the early 80s when I played minor league ball. Wow. He was getting in the movie business. And so as Steve and I get out of the car, Steve looks at me and goes, this is the last group. What is it you want? Yeah. And I said, I want a movie about kids who were counted out from the beginning, who got a second chance and found out, you know what, I can do more than I thought I could. And if I have the right people around me and we have the right teamwork, we can go as far as we want. And I said, the other part of that coin is I want people my then my age, even now, yeah. who may have given up on a dream or may have been told that was impossible or had the dream killers in their lives tell them you'll fail if you do that. Yeah. I want to see those people get a second chance and maybe take it and then see what happens. Because you don't want to wake up one day and go, what if? And I go upstairs and Michael Eisner said, he goes, what we have in mind is a movie about kids who were counted out from the beginning. I'm, I looked at Steve and I went, Mickey uh, Mouse has big ears, man. Yeah. And we were we were done before we walked out of the office. That's where we were going. And they ended up doing a great job. They picked Dennis. Dennis did a great job. The day he signed the contract, I went from teaching in a high school to playing big league ball to playing catch with a movie star yeah. in his front yard in Brentwood. And I'm like, is it is this happening? And so I call my mom after I get done and Dennis and I had talked a while. I get back in my truck and I call my mom and I said, guess where I am? And I told her and she goes, you suck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
mom's approval because she loves Dennis Quaid. So. Yeah, have fun, but you suck. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's going to be an awesome story. It's interesting. I was just thinking you've been, you know, you've been a public speaker now longer than you were a baseball player. Oh, absolutely. Isn't that crazy? So, I mean, it is, it be known as a baseball is, player, but it is weird to think this is the longest job I've ever had. Yeah. And, but it, it's the same, but it's different. And so every group I meet is different. Yeah. And so the, the stories or the lessons that I have will be different according to that group and according to what they want um, with pre-conference calls and stuff. And everybody loves second chances because we all need them. We all need it. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that, that's my podcast is that way for me. You know, it, it's a, uh, I grew up with a dad that said, you have a terrible voice. Like don't sing, you know, don't talk too much, that type of thing. And you're like, and maybe he was just tired of hearing me yap too much that one day. But as a kid, I was like, so now I didn't want, I didn't like my voice growing up. And everybody's like, oh, you have a great voice for radio, this and that. And I'm like, in my head over and over again, it was my dad saying, you have a terrible voice. So it took me a while. Those to things, yeah. Things that we said, even with five kids, their perception is their perception. Yeah. And one will think one thing and the other four go, no, it wasn't even close to being that way. Yeah. And I'm like, did we live in the same house, man? Because this is weird, but that's our perception. And, but everybody's got their own idea and perception of what life is and how they've been treated and what's been said to them. And then they build that up in their head. And my dad said enough negative things to me that I thought I would fail at everything I ever did. And what happens I end up being pretty successful at everything I did. <laughs> you're doing okay. Even school, you know, <laughs> you're, you're too dumb to go to college. Oh yeah. And then I go and I find out my anatomy professor thinks I should go to medical school. And I'm like, but I'm dumb. I'm dumb. Yeah. And like, no, you're not. And so the dream makers are the people we want around, yeah. around us, surround yourself with the best to be your best. And there are dream colors everywhere you turn. And especially now and today, it's 50-50 yeah. and there are positive and negative people and they have this approach or they have that approach or they have this political concept in their head or that political concept in their head. I want to stay right here so I can talk to everybody. Yeah. I don't want to talk to one half of the country or one half of the world. It is a message, I think, for everybody not to give up. Yeah. And to fight for what you believe in and to put everything you have into it so you don't wake up one day and go, what if? That's why I like being able to do what I do. I kind of got into the uh, saying yes factor. You know, for, for, through my 20s and 30s, even my 40s, I, I would say no to almost everything. You know, I had the kids and they were growing up. and But it was like, hey, do you want to go? Nah, that's uh, it's too far. And uh, it was just no a lot. And, and all of a sudden it's like, as I get into my fifties and kids move out, I'm saying yes to things. And all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, because I said yes to that. Now I'm meeting this person. So it means I get to go see this person. You know what I mean? So the right. yeses are leading to more and more things. And it's, it's Absolutely. I mean, it puts you in front of more people. The thing I learned was I got so caught up in being a parent that I quit doing stuff. Yeah. And part of that, part of that for you is the same thing it is for me. Yeah going out scares me to death and I'm an introvert and I don't know that I have anything anybody wants to say that anybody wants to hear. And they just want me to be me and they yeah. want you to be you. And those are the people I want to be around. They just want us for us. 100%. Well, so you got, you got the book dream maker. You can get that on your website. What's the, what's the best way for fans to follow you and see what you have coming up? Uh, Jim, the rookie Morris.com is how people book me for speaking. It goes through my manager who happens to be my wife and, <laughs> and she gets back to people right She's away. She's very persistent. Her. Everybody. It drives her nuts. It's very to, good. Yeah. Uh, not keep up. And so Jim, the rookie Morris.com. Um, yeah, I'm Instagram. on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I'm on yeah. pretty much everything. And, 
I was looking at the list of people that you've interviewed and I'm thank you for allowing me to be the 300th person because that's saying something you've been on 300 times yes. and you're like still doing it episodes. and you're still smiling and you're still having fun. Heck yeah. I think that's, I think we, in our twenties and thirties, we think so much of ourselves that we take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. And then we get in our fifties and now I'm 60 and I'm like, I have no hair. I don't have to comb my hair <laughs> you know, and things just aren't that important anymore. Yeah. And that, that helps with the relationship side of it. And we can go out and be with the people we really want to be with and enjoy that relationship instead of worrying about, well, how do I look or that? What are they going to think of me if I don't yeah. dress up? You know, all that stuff goes out the window when you're around people who you love and who love you. Totally agree. I mean, that, that that's really what I, I just, I mean, how do you bottle that up in your fifties and give it to somebody in their twenties? You know, cause I sit there and go, man, if I had the, the, the wisdom and just the, the knowledge I have now of how I feel about myself now, like when I was in my twenties, forget about it. I would have conquered the world. I know. And I found it's very difficult with my kids to tell them the lessons that I've learned Yeah, because they live with me and I'm just dad. Yeah. But I can go out and I can talk to last week. I did um, FCA in Nebraska. I also talked to a university and then I talked to the coaches and three different perspectives from three different age groups. And they hung on every word that I said. Yeah. Because somebody else may have said it. You may have said something. I may have said something. But then the right person comes along, says the exact same thing and it clicks. Yeah. And then then we're sowing seeds. And so yeah. to be able to be a seed planter, that's that's my goal. And I'll do it as long as God wants me to. And when he doesn't want me to, I'll do something else. I'm not going to quit. I know that. But yeah, the cool thing about what you do too, I don't know if you ever think about it, you'll never know everybody that you've touched. Because, I mean, how many, how many times have you spoken now? Thousands, you know? And, and so you've reached tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, you'll never know exactly how you've affected them. And they might not even realize that, that, that their desire to not quit comes from watching the movie or reading your book or seeing you speak, but it's there, you know, and you're just, you won't get necessarily get the credit for it, but maybe you don't need it because you know, it's there. I don't need the credit for it. I know God puts me in front of who God wants me in front of. Yeah. And Everything that happens after that is his plan, not mine. I've learned that about myself over the years. I can think I'm in control and I can think I'm making the yeah. plans. That's not how it works. Not so much. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's pretty much the opposite way. Yeah. And so I'm having to adjust and readjust and, and move along in this world because I've been redirected. And speaking has been the one constant. And there are groups where I've started off doing one speech and then it's not resonating and I'll totally turn around and change it into something else. And then people will come up to me afterwards and they're like, we don't know how you did that transition. Yeah. But that was awesome. And it made us want to know what you said at the beginning again. I mean, just weird things. My wife picks up on. Yeah. Like when I start speaking, she goes like 30 seconds in and you're opening line and she goes, it just is dead quiet you could hear a pin drop and, and they're eating dinner and they quit eating dinner and yeah. they turn around yeah. and they're paying attention. Yeah. That makes me feel good. And that's reaffirming. And that takes me back to childhood when I couldn't do anything right. And now I'm getting a chance to see what being affirmed. Yeah. Affirmed is. And, and you're right. The stories that we share with people and the lessons that we teach people, we don't know who they're touching, Yeah, but hopefully the right people. I mean, we've had people like my father. Let's just take him because he's, he's easy. I've had people come up to me bawling after the talk, talking about how brutal their childhood was because of one parent or the other yeah. beating the daylights out of them. Or worse yet, the bruises go away. But it's the cursing down. And that's like putting a curse on somebody. Yeah. And because that's something they remember. Like I still remember at 60 being five and a half 
and my dad holding my baby brother going, this is the one we wanted. We never wanted you. And my parents divorced a long time ago. And my mom goes, he wanted me to abort you. And like, I wasn't even worth that thought. And so I don't ever want anybody that I talk to to think that I think that way about them. And so I'm very cautious and very careful. But I also like to make people laugh. And so I'll joke about stuff, but I joke about me yeah. and the mistakes I've made. And that, that resonates with them. And they go, I've done that. And then, and then, then you got a friend. Yeah. And in a relationship you didn't even know you had. So that's why I like doing what I do. Yeah. That's why I like traveling. Doing a great thing. But, well, well, I hope. Oh, no, you, you know you are. At this point, I guess after the first couple of years, you go, ah, I don't know. It was very unexpected. And the last thing I ever sure. thought I would do, and it's something I thought I wanted to be a baseball player when I was five. But now looking at it, this dream and being a father and being able to go out and talk to people, yeah, that has been a bigger dream because I'm not helping me anymore. I'm helping other people. And so that's the most important thing to me. And if you can learn off of my mistakes, that's great because maybe you won't repeat them. Well, it, it, I'll tell you this. We had uh, a similar experiences with coaches in high school so yeah and again i just go back it was it cultural was that how coaches were back then you know like i the coach i had in high school would not be a coach today he couldn't do it no i mean yeah like, they'd be thrown they'd be legally. thrown under the jail <laughs> legally our coach, our coach made us so tough if he said here's a tractor tire for each player take it to the stadium and it was five miles you got the tractor tire to the stadium yeah. and you didn't ask questions because back then the coaches ruled and we had different coaches who would go to different churches yeah. and you better be in one of those churches on Sunday, but they also would get on you about your grades. And so the parents were like a hundred percent behind them yeah. and the grandparents even more so because, you know, they grew up during world war two and the great depression. Same. And so they knew what hard work was. And that there were going to be hard times and you better be tough in order to take it. We've lost some of that toughness, I think. I, well, I, yeah, legally, I think they're not, I mean, I kind of my junior year, I broke my nose. It's still bent this way uh, in football. Just got smashed. It got, guy came through my face mask, blew up my nose, blood everywhere. We are away. So white Jersey, just blood everywhere. I was supposed to be on the next play. It happened on an extra point. I was supposed to be on the kick return. And I, I come up to you, I can't see, my eyes are watering, I got blood shooting out of my face. So I go right to the trainer, and all I hear is my last name being screened. <laughs> That's right, because you're not out there on special teams, man. So he comes over, he finds me, and the coach is like, and he looks at me, he's like, you know, because now he sees there's blood all over, and he goes, you all right? And I go, I don't know. I go, he goes, well, next time you come off the field, you better tell me you're coming off the field. In my head, I'm like, I figured you would have saw me, you know, Yeah. one in a white jersey, white pants, white face mask, blood everywhere, you know, didn't matter. You know, yeah. Our, imagine our, our coach would go, if you were hurt and you were on the field long enough, our coach would come out and he would kind of kick you in the side and go, are you hurt or are you injured? injured. Oh yeah. What? I read that too. Well, oh. if you had to think about it, get up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh yeah, that and that's how I ended up with the finger that doesn't bend anymore. There you go. I hurt my hand. I thought I just sprained it, so I taped it up. I ended up uh, the tendon had popped off, Ugh. so it slid down my hand. But I didn't know. I just taped it up and kept playing. And then uh, when I got into wrestling, I couldn't grab anything, so they had to operate and cut it out. So and that was all because you know that mentality of is it hurt? Well, it hurts, but I'm not injured. I'm not coming out because of it. Yeah, the one bad lesson I learned out of all that, Pete, was. Sometimes I don't know when to stop myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't feel that great, but I haven't worked out today and I haven't got my miles in. I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. And then you're like, you get halfway through, and you're like, I don't even know why I started this. Because it's that old mentality yeah. of, of you do it or you get made fun of in front of all the other players. Or... You get punished, but they get punished with you, which they makes do. it even worse. And they hate you even more. Oh, the wrestling team yeah. was like that. Well, I, we, 
our wrestling team, we ran. And you would have thought we were on cross country. I mean, it was like, he literally, like, I went back and read the yearbook and I want to print it out. The coach in the yearbook in 1982 said, we ran so much and that was our warm up. Like, so I knew that we were going to have a good group of wrestling, good group of kids because, you know, we put them through hell, basically. Because, like, we'd run three, four miles as our warm up. And I'm talking the hills and everything. And then we'd go have wrestling practice for two hours, you know? So. They, they can't i don't think parents would allow their kids to be used that way anymore not here in california no can't speak for other states well, not even in texas either but also news wasn't as up oh, to yeah. the second as it is now and you didn't back then you didn't hear about a kid who got dehydrated and passed out on the field or something yeah. and now you know within seconds who did what where when how and there's judgment well, I love concussion protocols. I'm like, oh. Yeah. The call was, you all right? Okay. You can yeah. Go. <laughs> yeah, get back in. Yeah. I was on offense, defense. I punted. I kicked. And so I never got off the field. Yeah. And there were a couple of times I kicked off and I thought, I hope I hit the ball. Because <laughs> my head was spinning. Yeah. And, and one of the times I gave myself a concussion, the field was muddy and I went to plant and kick. <laughs> and my feet went up in the air, and the first thing to hit was the back of my head. And then your head's spinning, you got to get up, and trick. And then the lineman comes and decks you again. The coach is going, Get off, Morris. And going, Yes, sir. Well, I, th- I always tell people I, I was a long snapper back when they could hit long snappers. Like they would literally, ha- I only saw one kick, one, one extra pointer field goal my entire senior year because they would just bury me. Like they would just yeah. like jump on me, and it was totally illegal. Now it's, now you're not allowed to get touched. I'm like, Pfft. That's like practice. I'm like, remember the first time I kicked off in high school in a varsity game? I was admiring my kick. It's going to go through the back of the end zone. And I got hit right here. <laughs> and my helmet turned sideways. And I'm actually looking out of the ear hole. And I'm like, I will never do that again. That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> and you, you learn life by lessons, I guess. And some are harder mm-hmm. than the others. Yeah, you know, and, and now they happen. That same thing happens, but it's different in business. But there's sometimes yeah. you hit. I feel like I'm looking at the ear hole again. There is, and you know what? It's not allowed now. What they did to us back then. Yeah, but it's made us a lot more resilient for things that go on now. I believe. I, I totally agree. And we can we can take the bad news and go. Okay, okay. that didn't work. I know. I time to pull back, replan remold and go after it again and then you change the plan you change the dream and you move on yeah and we're i don't want to be rude but entitlements become big and people want something just because they want it instead of actually having to earn it and back then you didn't complain you just did if you were told you did and i would say i miss that because I learned how to be tough from my growing up. Yeah. And, and I, I always think my uncle had a lot of good stories after my dad passed. And, uh, like, I'm like, well, he treated me, he did, you know, you like, you always want your kid to do better than you did. And you, 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 you hope you treat your, your, your children better than how you felt you were treated, mistreated. And I, I heard some stories from my uncle about my grandfather. And I was like, Oh, I guess I had it good comparatively, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the beatings that, yeah. that went on in that lifestyle, you know, in Cleveland, Ohio in the, in the forties and fifties was not fun. Yeah. I remember my grandmother on my mom's side, I would go visit her and she'd say, go give me a switch. First of all, I just moved from Florida. I'm like, what is a, a switch? switch? <laughs> yeah. And then she would tell me, and I'd go out and find the smallest one I could. Yeah. And that was a mistake. And uh, I learned very quickly, don't do that. And sometimes lessons are easy. I'm left-handed, so it takes me a little bit longer than other people. But <laughs> I will get the message eventually. Yeah. And I grew up at a time in a way that makes me who I am now. Yeah. And I've, I've seen how it was done. And I knew one thing as a parent going in, if I did everything the opposite of how my parents did it, 
my kids will be better off. And that's how I think it is with a lot of people our age. Yeah. And you just have to take things with a grain of salt. If I could have had my grandparents growing up, that would that would have been so big for me because I saw two people building each other up, not tearing each other down. Mm-hmm. And that negativity wasn't there. It was positivity. We got to work hard. But then at the end of the day, there's a payoff. You go work hard. You don't complain. And you don't ever ask anybody else to get dirty unless you're already dirty yourself. Yeah. This is like life. life is hard. We're going to do this. Had it not been for my grandparents from 15 to 18, I wouldn't be here talking to you either. Wow. Yeah. See, my, my grandfather was a motorcycle cop in Cleveland. So after he'd beat my dad, he'd say, What are you going to call my friends? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was like, Okay. <laughs> And that was my That's uncle tough. telling me. That wasn't my dad telling me. My dad would never talk about it. You know, he was a total recluse, shut in. And so that's why I heard the stories from my uncle. I'm like, oh, I guess I should be thankful, <laughs> you know, that I didn't get that, that end of it. So, yeah, there were some stories I've heard from back in the dust bowl days and things when my grandparents were growing up. That it, yeah. I'm like, how did you get to adulthood? I just, I don't even know how you lived through some of that. And, but I was young and I didn't know to ask those questions back then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm glad I have them in my life now. And then Ernest got sick and with ALS and then I couldn't ask the questions. And then I got older and I'm like, man, I wish, I wish I would have been more inquisitive about my family back then. So I would know more about what all they went through because I don't, every time I ask my grandmother, I said, where are we from? Oklahoma. No, but where? Yeah, Oklahoma. <laughs> I, I guess we're from Oklahoma, and they didn't talk about the past. They were too busy living today. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's good too. I guess yeah. You know, I'm in the same boat. I mean, I kind of feel like my podcast at some point, if my you know my, my kids, my grandkids will be able to listen back to the episodes and kind of hear parts of their grandfather, just like you know your book and 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 the speeches you've done and recorded and all that. You know, you're you're getting a chance to share what you what what wasn't shared with you. I mean, I knew nothing about my parents, nothing, like nothing. So it's uh, they, they never talked about it. I heard about it from mine because they were loud, <laughs> and I knew I could look at the way they got out of the car and know if I need to hide or not. I mean, that's oh yeah, that's the kind of. Dude. That's the kind of way they carried themselves. And I'm like, oh, crap. And it's time to go hide. And that didn't work either. So yeah. I quit doing that. But it's been a different era. Yeah, yeah. Every Korean, generation so, is different. I think it was seven or eight. We were in Arizona at the time because that's where I was born. And I saw my dad beat up three guys at, at, at a bowling alley after uh, they were in a bowling league, my mom and dad. And then I would go once in a while. And uh, they were they said some crappy things to my mom it was me and my mom out front and then my dad came out and just i was like oh took took care of business yeah yeah you don't ever talk bad to my mom that was that was off off limits yeah i was scared to death of my dad and he could talk spanish better than hispanics could and one day we were coming out of a gas station we got a strawberry pop or something with peanuts in it and They started talking to each other in Spanish about my mom. Wrong news. And he just looked at us and said, get in the car. Yeah. And then he turned around and uh, they didn't have much to say after that. Yeah. He took care of business. I know. That's different, different era. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't afraid about going to jail for assault. He just just beat him up and he left. That was it. Yep. There was no cops. There was no filming. There was no camera phones. It was like that's right. <laughs> it happened. There was no different point of view. There was a yeah. point of view of you, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, but I I want to take any more of your time. Thank you so much for being my three hundredth guest. It means the world to me. Thank you so. for allowing me. Thank you for allowing me to be. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll get everybody onto your website and any companies or co- corporations want to hire you to go speak. 
book them now. <laughs> are you are you pretty well booked yeah. for twenty five, right? Getting there. We're getting there, man. Yeah. yeah, it's getting even calls today, and uh, usually around we get around Halloween time, things start slowing down a little bit. Things are actually picking up, and so blessing. Yeah, book me now, man. <laughs> you got it. And then uh, go and on congratulations. The yeah. Congratulations on 300. I, I really appreciate the, the time. And thank you, Jim. That means a lot to me. Yes, so, sir. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Yes, sir.